Um, so yeah, I'm excited to be sharing uh, information today on challenges with interpreting antibody-based tests. Um, this is a phenomenon that we uh, frequently see in the laboratory uh, nutrition and laboratory wellness setting, um, how to interpret tests that antibody-based tests that have um, hypo and hypergamma globulinemia. So let's go. The first thing I want to address really is, I guess I'll, I'll call it a, um, maybe a misperception that when you have test interference that it really um, influences the test validity or um, makes those results invalid. Um, and that's not the case. Um, you can have test interference and still have reliable, valid, precise, and accurate results. You just really need to think critically about interpreting the tests and your um, you know, clinical decision-making. Of course, you need a, a good clinical history so you can correlate your findings, but test interference does not impact the validity of the results. It in, impacts the interpretation of the results. One of the most well-known um, interferences with antibody-based tests or serological tests is the use of immunosuppressant medications, um, which are a class of drugs that suppress or reduce the immune response. Steroids are the most common class of immunosuppressants, whether they're um, administered via different routes, such as oral, inhaled, or IV. Um, but there are other classes that also have an immunosuppressant um, effect, other classes of medications, including JK inhibitors, uh, calcium urine inhibitors, mTOR inhibitors, um, IMDH inhibitors, biologics, and monoclonal antibodies. Because immune suppressant medications may lower total immunoglobulins, uh, patients should wait approximately 30 to 60 days after discontinuing immunosuppressant medications or test total immunoglobulins prior to ordering antibody-based tests. And I hope you heard the emphasis on the approximately 30 to 60 days because the immune response is so highly variable um, that we can't really give an accurate predictor of how quickly people will recover after the, immuno, uh, the use of immunosuppressant medication. Providers needing more information on immunosuppressant medication can visit drugs.com to look at the classes of immunosuppressants and uh, the generic or um, uh, you know, um, uh, generic classes of drugs that fit into those categories. Another common um, interference with serological tests is the use of intravenous immunoglobulin G therapy or IVIG. When you're administering uh, IG immunoglobulins, IgG immunoglobulins, it can have the potential to cause hypergamma globulinemia, uh, which leads to uh, false highs or false positives on serologic tests. Again, this doesn't invalidate the, the test results. It just requires critical thinking in interpretation and decision-making. This is a nice paper uh, you may want to access online uh, that goes over the challenges with IVIG use. So there are causes of low and high total immunoglobulins um, that should be considered when your results uh, return um, either a high or a low total IgA or IgG or IgE. Um, the first thing to consider when exploring causes of low total immunoglobulins um, are conditions that can cause an abnormal loss or uh, an increased catabolism of immunoglobulins. That can include nephrotic syndrome or other, you know, severe renal diseases, um, burns, sepsis, protein losing enteropathies, GI enteropathies, or um, you know, more concerningly like an intestinal lymphangiectasia. Uh, uh, conditions that uh, will affect your immunoglobulin production are what we see more commonly in the ambulatory setting or the wellness uh, testing setting, such as malnutrition or um, abuse of alcohol that can also contribute to uh, uh, lower immunoglobulin production 
Also, some of the drugs I mentioned earlier, the immunosuppressive drugs, chemotherapy agents, uh, malignancies can also contribute to low total immunoglobulins, including uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, lymphoma, multiple myeloma. Very commonly at Vibrant America, we do see uh, many, many of our uh, tested patients do have rheumatological diseases, um, including rheumatoid arthritis or systemic lupus erythematous. Um, so with lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, we will you know, often see lower total immunoglobulins. Um, and then viruses, we do test, uh, offer a viral infection panel that has Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, many of the human herpes viruses, and all of these uh, viral infections can impact uh, total immunoglobulin production. From a high total immunoglobulin perspective, things to consider are um, what can cause an increase in immunoglobulins, uh, a polyclonal increase in one or all of the classes of immunoglobulins. Usually if there's just one class of immunoglobulins, high or low, it's easier to interpret uh, your serologic tests. The more classes that are impacted, uh, then the greater the potential for you know, false positives or false negatives. Uh, but again, it doesn't invalidate the findings. It just really requires a more kind of critical thinking approach. So some of the conditions that you'll see with high total immunoglobulins, uh, which we routinely see here at Vibrant are again, infections. And, and that's uh, the beauty of the immune system. Um, you know, many viral infections can cause both low and high total immunoglobulins, depending upon where it is in the timeline of infection, early or late, convalescent period, et cetera. Uh, connective tissue diseases, again, similar to causing low total immunoglobulins, may also cause high total immunoglobulins, um, autoimmune hepatitis, primary biliary cirrhosis, um, hematological disorders, non-hematological malignancies. And if we're seeing monoclonal increase in one class uh, without a uh, decrease in the other two classes, you may want to consider workup for you know, um, a multiple myeloma or uh, leukemia, some of the hematologic um, malignancies essentially, um, or uh, primary systemic amyloidosis. So just a further immunological workup. More often than not, what we see at Vibrant really is um, hypo or hypergammaglobulinemia related to infections, most commonly autoimmunity and uh, immunosuppressive medications or IVIG. I would say those are the kind of four scenarios that we see the most commonly with test interpretation. I do want to comment on uh, mal the impact of malnutrition on humoral uh, immune function. I know some of our uh, thought leaders that are presenting later in the day will be, uh, you know, certainly discussing more clinical applications, but um, it would be remiss of me not to comment on the, the impact of malnutrition on humoral immune function um, before I move on more to interpretation of tests. So malnutrition will lower secretory IgA. It will also increase intestinal permeability, stimulate immune complex formation, contribute to the formation of IgG food antibodies, uh, lead to complement levels decreasing, which in turn will influence opsonization of antigens that will decrease and contribute to inflammation and cytokine activation. And it's a pretty uh, kind of vicious cycle, if you will. So one of the things you can certainly consider or a few of the things you could consider for um, kind of reversing that uh, malnutrition effect on humoral immune function would be uh, consider colostrum, proline-rich peptides, collagen, and antioxidants for immune and cytokine modulation. So again, I'm not focusing so much on the clinical applications today, but more the test interpretation. So let's take a look at some common scenarios that we see here at Vibrant America. Um, when you are reviewing a report where you have a high total IgA or IgG, or if you have a low total IgA or IgG, 
the, the key, key determinant that you really want to look at to determine, to interpret the results and apply them to your patient um, and your clinical interventions and decision making really is, is there variability in the specific IgA, IgG results? So for example, if you have a high total IgA or IgG, if you see that most or all of the specific IgA, IgG results are high, well, then yes, you want to suspect interference. If your total IgA or IgG is low, and again, you see most or all of the specific IgA, IgG results high, mm, yes, then we're going to, again, suspect interference. However, alternatively, if you have a high total IgA or IgG, and yet you see some specific IgA or IgG results are normal, some are moderate, some are high, well, then you've got likely true antigen antibody reaction. Similarly, if you see total IgA or IgG are low, and you see some specific IgA, IgG normal, some are moderate results, some high results, well, again, then you likely have true antigen antibody reaction. It's very difficult to assess the magnitude of interference. Um, there's not a correction factor uh, with immunoglobulins. So you may uh, suspect some false elevations or some false lowering, but again, you really wanna look for the variability in the results. And while you may not be able to conclusively determine the degree or magnitude or effect, uh, effect size of the false elevation or false lowering, again, if you really see that variability, then you can determine that you're really looking at true antigen antibody reaction. Happily, I have an, a number of good examples of this that we routinely see um, you know, a, as a group of clinical lab educators here at Vibrant. So I will share those with you. Uh, this is, these are live results. Uh, this was a wheat zoomer. As you can see, the patient had a very high total IgG. It was 1,770. The in control range is 767 to 1,590. And as we look at the results on the wheat zoomer, and there are 48 results on the wheat zoomer, so again, we're going to be looking for variability in the results. What we don't want to see is all 48 of those results <laughs> being high. Then I would definitely suspect interference. So here, while we look at the total, uh, the celiac panel and the fusion peptide panel or uh, the trans uh, TTG DGP complex panel, what we see, what we see is that um, we see some normal results for uh, uh, transglutaminase 2, DGP IgG, um, transglutaminase DGP IgG complex. There are no moderate results in these two panels and no high results in these two panels. Let's look at the intestinal permeability panel here. Uh, we do see that um, there is a high anti-zonulin antibody, a high anti-actin antibody IgG, and a high anti-LPS IgG and IgM. There are no normal, um, I'm sorry, there are no moderately elevated results. Uh, there is a normal um, zonulin, anti-zonulin IgA um, and anti-actin IgA, but again, we're just focusing right now on the, the total IgG and the specific IgG levels. If we look at the Transglutaminase panel, the, I, uh, the specific IgG for transglutaminase 3 and transglutaminase 6 is normal. And in the wheat germ agglutinin panel, you do see that the wheat germ agglutinin IgG is high. In the gliadin panel here, now you see um, a number of results that are a number of specific IgG levels that are high, including alpha gliadin, alpha beta gliadin, gamma gliadin, omega gliadin, uh, prodinorphin IgG, and then low molecular weight glutenin IgG. However, you do see uh, gluteomorphin IgG is normal and glutenin IgG is normal. In the non-gluten wheat panel here, 
Uh, we see purinin IgG is moderately elevated, serpin IgG, ferronin IgG, amylase protease inhibitor IgG, and globulin IgG are elevated. So what can we conclude after we looked at these 48 um, results on the wheat zoomer test? Well, we have some normal and well-controlled, including at the lower end of normal, transglutaminase 2, DGP, transglutaminase DGP complex, transglutaminase 3, transglutaminase 6, gluteomorphin, and high molecular weight glutenin IgG antibodies. So in this example, it's reassuring. The, these antigen antibody, um, there's no reactivity. So it's clearly not interfered with from the high total IgG. We're not seeing false elevations in the specific IgG for those antigens. Given the many normal and well-controlled IgG autoantibodies, clinical interpretation is that, the, is that the high antigen specific IgG antibodies to most but not all of the gliadin, glutenin, and non-gluten wheat proteins does in fact reflect true gluten sensitivity and wheat sensitivity. There may be some degree, some magnitude, or some margin, some effect size of falsely elevated antigen-specific IgG results based on the total high IgG. Again, there's no correction factor, so it's a little inconclusive how falsely elevated they are, but since we saw such normal and well-controlled autoantibodies, again, we're seeing variability here. And that's what we really want to see. We wanna see variability in the antigen-specific IgG results. In this instance, we would recommend repeating um, total immunoglobulins and the wheat zoomer in six months. Now, here's an example of a Zoomer bundle where they, uh, the patient was tested for wheat, dairy, corn, egg, and soy, and had a low total IgG. So as we look through these, these, these food Zoomers, again, we really wanna look for variability in the specific IgG results. Here on the wheat Zoomer, what we see is uh, for normal results are transglutaminase 2 IgG, DGP IgG, uh, transglutaminase DGP IgG complex, uh, lipopolysaccharide IgG, transglutaminase 3 IgG, transglutaminase 6 IgG, and gluteomorphin IgG. All of those are normal. Um, however, you do have a moderately elevated high molecular weight glutenin IgG and a number of high specific IgG results, including zonulin, actin, wheat germaglutinin, um, alpha-beta gliadin, omega gliadin, uh, proteinorphin, low molecular weight glutenin, serpin, ferronin, amylase protease inhibitors, globulin, and purinin. So you have a number of high, highly elevated specific IgG results. So despite the low total IgG, you're actually seeing that this person is able to mount a um, very clear and very distinct um, immune response to those specific antigens, yet not mounting a, an immune response, an abnormal immune response to many of the autoantigens or to gluteomorphin, which is um, formed in the intestinal tract during the degradation of gliadin. So we're seeing nice variability here. So again, even though we've got this um, hypogamma globulinemia, you know, we are definitely seeing some normal, some moderate, and some high results. Let's look at their dairy zoomer. Again, here we have this low total IgG, but you can see this very, 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 very <laughs> highly reactive, um, you know, dairy zoomer. Uh, I believe we test for 13 casein and whey um, antigens on this test. And as you can see, all of them are reactive. Um, so, you know, this might have been if, if the person had, um, and again, this is a low total IgG, you know, so here we're really seeing, although we're seeing no variability as far as normal, um, we're seeing, you know, a number of moderate and positively elevated responses. So again, 
while they are not able to make enough total immunoglobulin G, they certainly are mounting a very um, discriminatory immune response to casein and whey proteins. So um, that's the beauty of, you know, uh, kind of test, don't guess, you know, so often providers will say, well, you know, I'm reluctant to do um, these food zoomers because my patient's immunosuppressed um, or they've had IVIG therapy, you know, whether we're worried about hypo or hyper gamma globulinemia, I can't tell you how often we really see these variability of results. Um, you know, the immune sy system is so, so highly discriminatory. So, um, I find the more results you have, the better it's able to really assess for this variability. Say you just have one zoomer, like the wheat zoomer, you know, um, you may question, but once you have four zoomers and you go through, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, 120 results and you see that maybe, you know, 30 are moderately elevated or um, moderately or positively elevated and 90 or normal, well, you know, again, then you can say, hmm, I don't believe the hypogamma globulinemia or the hypergamma globulinemia has interfered with these results. I suspect true antigen antibody um, reactivity. Now here, same person again, here's the corn zoomer um, that was done. And look at this. I mean, you know, sometimes I open these zoomer bundles and I'm just, you know, um, constantly amazed at the human immune system. Like here, zero reactivity to corn. Um, you know, none, you know, to, to none of the corn antigens, including the pollen antigens, which we see so many people reactive to in clear contrast with this dairy zoomer where they're reacting to every dairy antigen. And on the same person, this is their zoomer bundle, this is their egg zoomer. And again, low total IgG, but now look at their reaction to all of the, you know, egg white antigens and the egg yolk antigens. Everything is positive across <laughs> the board. Um, so, you know, it's just so hard to predict a person's uh, immune response. You know, here we've got someone who has, you know, some immune suppression, yet their immune system is clearly viewing egg white and egg yolk as, you know, uh, something to target for further destruction. So the soy zoomer, now here, zero reactivity. So again, you know, low total IgG, but all results are normal. So we've really seen quite, quite a, a wide range of um, reactivity for this person. So what can we conclude? Um, here for low total IgG, despite that, we see that this patient had elevated specific IgG antibodies to zonulin, actin, prodinorphin, 12 of 13 gluten and non-gluten wheat proteins, eight of 11 dairy proteins tested, and nine of 11 egg proteins tested. The patient had normal specific IgG bot antibodies to transglutaminase 2, DGP, transglutaminase uh, DGP complex, uh, lipopolysaccharide, transglutaminase 3, and transglutaminase 6, gluteomorphin, beta casein, beta lactoglobulin, serum albumin, ovotransferrin, and apovitellin proteins. And I always do find it interesting to really compare the different reactivity to the autoantigens or the self antigens versus the food antigens. I will say that, you know, it's, um, it's definitely variable. We certainly see many people who have their autoantibodies elevated. Um, but very often we'll also see those autoantigens normal, but the food antigens, um, whether it's, you know, dairy or corn or soy or egg or, uh, you know, peanut, tree nut, seafood antigens to see those significantly elevated. Um, and to me, that's actually encouraging. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> you know, I'd rather see the food antigens elevated because we can eliminate those as opposed to the autoantigens. Um, so, you know, just kind of taking a critical look at it. Um, this patient had normal specific IgG antibodies to all 13 corn proteins and all 11 soy protein tested. Um, 
Noteworthy was that they had high IgA antibodies to all dairy and egg proteins tested. So even though they had a normal um, total IgA, and on the other, um, uh, you know, on the corn zoomer, the soy zoomer, the wheat zoomer, they had no IgA antibodies to any of the corn, soy, or wheat antigens. They really mounted this very highly specific IgA antibody response to the dairy and egg proteins. So I always, you know, think that's much more clinically significant and, um, you know, we'll often convey that to the patient that, you know, from an educational perspective that your immune system is being so discriminatory towards dairy and egg that it's actually mounting, um, you know, two antibody responses to it, sending out two antibody classes to target it, um, that food antigen for destruction. So again, a little more clinically significant. So here we see a wide range of variability in the specific IgG antibodies. So despite low total IgG, um, the likelihood of falsely lowered or false negative IgG results, it, it appears unlikely. Now here we have um, a high total IgA with a Zoomer bundle. You can see the total IgA um, at the bottom of the screen, it's 484. And this was someone who had done a previous um, test. Um, in fact, their total IgA had improved. It was higher, it was 516, but it had come down to 484, but still elevated. So again, many of our providers would be questioning, you know, um, how does this influence the results? Does this mean it's invalid, which I've emphasized it's not, um, you know, but to what degree of interference is there? And, um, you know, how can this influence my, um, you know, decision making? So here, when we look for variability in the specific IgA results, we see um, normal specific IgA results for transglutaminase 2, TG, um, transglutaminase DGP complex, uh, zonulin, actin, uh, lipo, um, uh, li I'm sorry, uh, transglutaminase 3 and 6, wheat germagglutinin, all four isoforms of gliadin, alpha, alpha, beta, gamma, and omega, gluteomorphin, prodinorphin, both high and low molecular weight glutenin. And then um, of the non-gluten wheat proteins, we see um, serpin, ferronin, amylase protease inhibitors, um, and globulins and purinins, also normal. We do see for IgA, the only high IgA response here is for DGP. Now, that's certainly very clinically significant, um, but given the, the degree of um, specific IgA results that are normal, I'm not thinking that this is, you know, a false interference, okay? Um, same person also tested for dairy. And what do we see? You know, we see that all specific IgA results are normal. They certainly have some elevated IgG, um, uh, you know, specific IgG results, but no uh, elevation of any of their specific IgA results. Now here on their corn zoomer, again, you really, you know, I'm such a fan of test don't guess because you just, you really can't predict. It's so highly variable. Now looking at their corn zoomer, um, you can see it's very reactive um, for specific IgA results. Um, we do see Zane IgA is normal, Glutelin IgA is normal, Expansin IgA is normal, and Profilin IgA is normal. However, You've got a moderately elevated albumin IgA, globulin, endochitinase, lipid transfer protein, thioredoxin, exopolygalacturonase, um, pollen allergen, and the corn crystal protein IgA results are all moderately elevated. And then strongly or highly positive is the corn wheat overlap epitope. Um, that's the one that most um, uh, resembles or has the most molecular mimicry with um, gliadin in wheat. So it really induces that uh, gluten-like response in cor from corn. Um, so here, as opposed to um, uh, on the dairy zoomer where you see no specific IgA reactivity, and um, on the wheat zoomer you see 
just one specific IGA result um, that was positive. Um, you know, here you're seeing much more specific IgA reactivity. They also did a nut zoomer and zero IgA, specific IgA reactivity. All specific IgA results were normal. Um, so conclusions. Well, on the dairy zoomer, despite high total IgA, all antigen specific IgA results were normal. On the nut zoomer, Ditto, same thing. The wheat zoomer, we did see almost, almost all antigen specific IgA results were normal. 21 of the results were normal and you had only one antigen specific IgA result elevated. But again, very clinically noteworthy that it's DGP IgA. So, you know, uh, you know high clinical suspicion for celiac. The corn zoomer, as um, noted earlier, shows much, much more specific IgA positivity compared to the wheat and dairy zoomers. Of the antigen-specific IgA results, four were normal, eight were moderately elevated, and one was positively elevated. This likely reflects true IgA sensitization to these corn peptides, though, again, there may be some degree, again, some kind of magnitude or effect size um, of uh, or, or kind of margin of falsely elevated results. Again, we can't, um, there's no correction factor, we can't predict, but given the very high variability that we've seen in these specific IgA results, the overall conclusion is that basically despite high total IgA, the Zoomer bundle had mostly normal antigen specific IgA results. It is definitely possible that a few of the moderate and positively elevated results may be falsely elevated, but again, it likely reflects true IgA sensitization given the majority of normal specific IgA results. So what happens, I do wanna comment, this is a common question um, in regards to uh, when will I expect these results to normalize? Um, you know, once we have this antigen anti antibody binding, what happens next? Um, and I always think of antigen antibody binding as um, kind of like a lock and key or a puzzle piece um, mechanism. You, once they bind, they're, they're kind of very form, um, uh, kind of very firmly uh, bound together. And then they have to be broken down by either the liver, the spleen or the complement system. And they can, and the antigen antibody complex can linger for some time in the body. Um, once it's bound, basically, you know, uh, it, it signals the immune system to target that antigen for destruction, either by opsonization or by phagocytosis or um, by cytolysis or um, antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity by natural killer cells or neutralization of the exotoxins or the viruses um, or agglutination of microorganisms, immobilization of bacteria and protozoans for the infectious antigens, um, you know, for the viruses and bacteria and protozoa, different than for your food antigens, um, promotion of inflammatory response and sometimes formation of immune complexes. So the most common question that, uh, um, you know, we here in the clinical lab education setting is like, how long will it take for these, um, you know, antigen antibody um, complexes to uh, disappear, if you will, from uh, blood, you know, um, especially upon elimination of the food antigens different than the infectious antigens or the autoantigens. And I wish I had a clear, good um, black and white answer. Um, as you know, in um, medicine and health, um, and I, I believe it's true in laboratory science as well, um, while laboratory science is definitely a very, um, you know, black and white and kind of quantitative science, um, you know, everything is very highly, you know, mathematical, um, you know, very precise, um, you know, calculations. Unfortunately, while laboratory uh, science is a very kind of black and white um, field, the interpretation of it is really 50 shades of gray. So you could give the same, you know, 
um, the, you could have three people who have the same uh, results, uh, roughly, and one person might recover. They're, those antigen-specific antibodies might normalize in three months upon elimination of the food antigen or the environmental antigen or elimination or avoidance. Um, for someone else, it might take as much as six months. Another person, it could take nine months, could even be a year. Um, or longer. It really is highly dependent upon the specific antigen, the timeline of exposure to the antigen, um, the antibody type that is being made to the antigen, and the individual's immune response. And because each individual can have, you know, a, a very clinic, you know, a, a clinical history that varies from, you know, uh, well on the wellness spectrum to very ill on the illness end of the spectrum and have multiple, uh, you know, comorbidities, you can really see a very highly, highly variable immune response. So with an environmental antigens, it's a little easier, you know, you do um, uh, avoidance of the antigen, uh, remediation of the antigen, food antigens also dependent upon avoidance of the antigen. Infection, infectious antigens, a little more difficult. Uh, it really depends upon the person uh, mounting a, you know, adequate immune response and recovery from the infection. Um, and of course, you can have later uh, reactivation. Um, with autoantigens, definitely um, uh, longer time you can see it can take for those antibodies um, to return to normal. Um, sometimes it you may not see them return to normal. Um, you really can't avoid your autoantigens or your self antigens. Um, so, you know, in autoimmunity where it's characterized by phases, right? You have, you know, initiation, propagation, resolution or remission, uh, relapse where you have exacerbation or flares. Sometimes those, um, you know, autoantibodies will, you know, spike up, um, drop down, um, and they can be influenced by uh, many different, um, you know, kind of internal and external factors. So generally speaking, when patients ask, when should we expect to see these results, you know, normalize or improve, and when should we retest? Um, it is variable. It could be three months, could be six months, could be nine months. If you really strictly avoided the antigen, the environmental antigen and the food antigen, by one year, certainly we'd expect to see with very strict adherence and avoidance and remediation that these antigen antibody complexes would be um, you know, destroyed or removed from um, the body. Again, variable. Um, some people can be refractory. Um, for retesting purposes, my general recommendation is to retest within three to six months. So from the first time you test and detect the abnormalities, retest within three to six months, retest at 12 months, and assuming your results are all going in the right direction, well then retest annually. That's kind of my Zoomers, food Zoomers retesting recommendations. Retest at three to six months, 12 months, and annually thereafter. Um, the annually thereafter is for wellness screen, much like you would do, you know, an annual physical. Um, so we haven't discussed at all challenges in interpreting IgE antibody-based tests. And um, I've gained a true appreciation for the need to do IgE antibody-based testing in conjunction with IgA and IgG food sensitivity testing, especially in people with um, uh, you know, in, uh, inhaled allergy, environmental allergies, especially in um, people who have uh, pollen allergies, because we will often see so many of those cross-reactive pollens um, that people do have oral allergy syndrome or pollen food syndrome that often goes undetected, especially when we talk about the class one or class two um, IgA sensitization. So I do recommend testing um, IgE foods and inhalants um, when you have a clinical suspicion for environmental allergies, 
especially if the person has respiratory or dermatological symptoms of unknown etiology, um, and they've got lots of IgA and IgG food sensitivities, or if they've also have a history of um, IgE allergy to medications, um, then I would definitely recommend an IgE foods and inhalants panel. Um, often we look at an, an, a total IgE first, just kind of as a screen. It is a traditional index for allergic disease screening. Um, however, its specificity is relatively poor. Um, specific IgE, on the other hand, has higher specificity for identifying allergic disease. Um, a normal level of total IgE does not eliminate the possibility of allergic disease. Um, however, you, you can also have a high GE um, in allergic disease, but also other diseases, including hyper IgE syndrome. We don't see that. That's, you know, we see that much um, less frequently at Vibrant America. But you also can see it in other primary immunodeficiencies, infections. Um, including parasitic infections, we'll often see that total IgE, um, you know, significantly elevated. Sometimes, literally, it can even be as high as 3,000, uh, 2,000. Again, this is rare to see. Um, you can also see higher um, total IgE in inflammatory diseases and malignancies. Um, more often than not, we're seeing high total IgE at the lower end of the range, you know, from 87 to 200, maybe in extremes 300, 500, or 800. Um, you know, only a handful of times do we really see that total IgA getting up into that, you know, 1200, 2000, et cetera. Sometimes you may run a total, I, um, a, a total IgE panel, and then you may do uh, the specific IgE for foods and inhalants, and yet every specific IgE finding comes back negative for the foods and inhalants. Um, and again, that's something providers will often question the validity of it. You know, how can, you know, they've got a high total IgE, how can all of their 96 antigens, uh, food and inhalant antigens we tested for be negative? Well, it doesn't mean that the person doesn't have any, um, you know, uh, allergic disease. Um, uh, it just says, well, the, there's a hypothesis, it's called the missed antigen hypothesis. Well, you're likely having a um, IgE reaction to something we did not test for. <laughs> We've only tested for 96 foods and inhalants. Um, Vibrant America tests for the most common 96 foods and inhalants um, here in the United States. But of course, there are many, many more, um, you know, uh, allergens or antigens in our food supply and in our environment than 96, you know. Um, so if you do run a total, um, if you do run a, a specific IgE foods and inhalant test and all 96 come back negative, um, it's not that the test isn't valid. It's just that hmm, we ha just haven't identified what they are having an allergic reaction to. So when you interpret specific IgE, um, it, it, you know, there's definitely a lot of uh, comparisons to skin prick testing. I will say that serum specific IgE has higher reproducibility than skin prick testing. Um, another advantage is that serum specific IgE is not influenced by, the, by treatment with antihistamines or anti-inflammatory medications. So sometimes that's an advantage if you can't get your um, patient off of the antihistamines. Um, the higher the level of antigen specific IgE, the more likely there it is that there will be a clinical response to the antigen. But I will say that um, it, it's not necessarily predictive of the severity of a reaction and it doesn't guarantee a reaction will occur. Um, not the first time upon exposure, the second, not the 10th, the 12th, it could be the 100th time they're exposed to this food or um, inhalant. Um, the higher the level of antigen-specific IgE, though, um, the greater the probability that the allergy will persist um, or the reduced probability of developing tolerance. Um, so, you know, you can outgrow, quote unquote, um, an allergy or develop a, an, an immune tolerance to it. But the higher the level of antigen-specific IgE, the uh, lower the likelihood of, um, you know, developing an immune tolerance. 
there are six classes of IgE um, reactivity. I cannot tell you how often we do a wheat zoomer, a corn zoomer, a dairy zoomer, an egg zoomer and detect class one or class two sensitivity. Um, even class three sensitization. I just had a recent, you know, egg zoomer that came back with a class three sensitization. So undetected IgE food or inhalant allergy can often contribute to the symptomatology. And if you've only done um, IgA and IgG food sensitivity testing, you may not be capturing that. It may be going undetected. And then you're eliminating the foods that they're reactive to on the IgG, IgG, IgA, IgG food sensitivity test, yet you haven't identified um, you know, their IgE um, allergies. So I, I really love to pair um, IgE food and inhalant testing with the Zoomers, quite frankly, to really um, you know, just identify um, the variable immune responses to foods and inhalants. Again, we've already seen so many examples of different types of reactivity with IgA and IgG, and we see the same with IgE. I do want to comment, um, we've got just a few more slides, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to the next speaker. I do want to comment on antigen variability between labs, because a very common challenge that comes up in interpreting uh, serological um, tests is someone will say, well, you know, um, my patient tested um, positive previously for, um, you know, a specific food or inhalant, but when we did the vibrant test, they tested negative to it. Um, how can that be? Well, there can be a number of um, reasons for that. One is antigen variability between labs. Um, for our food sensitivity test, Vibrant uses only FDA approved purified natural or recombinant antigen extracts on the food sensitivity test. Um, we have, there is considerable, you know, uh, just look in the kind of uh, scientific literature, you'll see there's um, considerable variation has been found when you compare food antigen extracts due to differences in extraction processing method, preparation, including heat treatment and storage. So it's really difficult to compare allergy test results um, or food sensitivity test results without knowing the specific antigen source material. Um, so an example, um, you know, was it a chicken egg white versus a hen egg white? Uh, was it black walnut versus English walnut? Was it catfish filet with the skin versus catfish filet without the skin? Um, was it boiled and frozen Atlantic shrimp mix versus, you know, raw frozen white brown pink shrimp mix um, for, you know, birch tree, is it white or silver or black birch, um, uh, oak tree, white versus black oak. Um, so you always really want to get a good history from the patient on when they last did their um, test, you know, if they report to you that I, I tested positive previously to a food or inhalant. You want to get a get your hands on that report <laughs> that they did previously. You want to know how long ago was it? If it was five years, seven years, ten years? Well, obviously, you know, um, if you haven't been tested in the you know time between, you know, so um, you know, definitely critical thinking is required to um, you know determine why someone may test positive previously but negative this time. You always want to question a patient's self-report of allergies. You know, when were you, they diagnosed? Was the allergy diagnosed based on an allergic reaction alone without allergy testing? Um, was the allergy diagnosed after a, a blood test, a skin prick test? When was the last time you had a follow-up allergy blood test or skin prick test? I'd say that's the most common we see. People will say, oh, I you know, was tested 15 years ago. Well, that explains it, you know, your immune system, you know, I mean, really nothing can be true for 15 years in the human body practically. Um, and you always want to ask, do you have a copy of that allergy, te allergy test result with the specific antigens that were tested? You know, key points are really that specific IgE levels can increase, decrease, and or normalize over time, depending upon the antigen exposure and many other physiological factors. 
So specific IgE should be monitored over time. This is true of IgA and IgG food sensitivity testing too. You know, you want to take all of these things into account in questioning um, patient self-reports of either um, allergy or sensitization. Um, if they tested positive to the food before, um, again, we talked about the antigen variability, but it is possible they may have developed a tolerance um, to the previously sensitized food. Um, they've outgrown it. Um, we see that specific IgE antibodies to food often appear within the first two years of life, um, and then levels may increase or decrease. Um, a decrease is often associated with the ability to tolerate the foods. The time course of this food allergy resolution in children varies um, and may occur as late as the teenage year. Um, again, the higher the specific IgE against the food, the lower the rate of resolution or outgrowing it or developing immune tolerance over time. Uh, most children, and I, I won't speak too much about children because Suzanne Barker from the clinical lab education team will be speaking about um, you know, children uh, pediatric testing later. Um, most children uh, can go on to eventually um, tolerate, develop immune tolerance to milk or egg or soy or wheat. Um, however, uh, tree and nut, um, tree nut and peanut allergy often tends to persist. And a food allergy like IgE mediated food allergy that starts in adulthood often tends to persist. Um, a few resources that you may find helpful are um, from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. They've got a wonderful, uh, two wonderful resources for guidelines for the diagnosis and management of food allergy in the United States. Uh, you can use these with your IgE testing um, for foods. And um, it's nice, they've got a guidelines for clinicians and they've also got a nice booklet for patients, families and caregivers. Um, so, what can we conclude based on you know, some of these diagnostic and interpretive challenges with serologic tests? Um, one, we definitely cannot view immune, immunology through this kind of binary lens of normal versus abnormal or high versus low or healthy versus sick. We really have to consider that immunological responses are highly divergent. They depend largely on the type of antigen um, and critically, the individual's immune response, which is going to uh, differ very widely, not only between individuals with that kind of inter-individual variability, but even within the individual, intra-individual variability, depending upon what's going on you know, in their life, other comorbid illness, stress, sleep deprivation, um, you know, hormonal shifts. So, you know, immunological response can really vary tremendously, um, you know, between individuals and even within the individual. And as much as we as clinicians would love to have these kind of absolute black and white and unconditional guidelines um, and, and truly simplified test interpretation for antibody-based, you know, serological tests, we really can't have these, you know, it's, again, going back to this kind of gray thinking, there are, are, there are many scientific uncertainties, there's many research gaps and clinical practice gaps that still present diagnostic challenges and limitations. However, um, you know, putting on that critical thinking cap and um, having good clinical cor correlation, um, you really can arrive at, you know, diagnostic decision making and clinical applications um, for your patients. And um, that's pretty much it for me today. I'm going to turn it over. I know, um, you know, I, we could probably have about three minutes for questions before the next speaker is um, set to present. Thanks, Mary Beth. That was awesome. Um, I think that you hit on so many frequently asked questions that you and the rest of the clinical team get about um, how do I interpret this? And so I think, I think basically you, you kind of hit all of the major points there. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so there is one question. And um, so Sarah, I think that Brie covered that in the, the Q and A when you asked it, but I'll go ahead and just re-ask it. Mary Beth may be able to elaborate. Um, there's a question from Sarah as far as blood spot. Um, if it doesn't allow for the total immunoglobulin, um, does it make it less accurate than having the blood drawn for the test? 
um, that does allow for the total. And I, I know the answer, but I'll let you answer it too, since you're the yeah, no, I mean, it's not going to influence the accuracy, um, you know, reliability, or re reproducibility or precision of the results, you know, um, it can influence your interpretation. But what you need to look for is that variability. You know, if you see um, that, you know, you've got some normal responses, some moderate responses, some high responses, then I'm not concerned about, um, you know, hypo or hyper gamma globulinemia. If you open up that dried blood spot, you know, zoomer, and you see like every response is highly elevated, uh oh, you know, every IgG is highly elevated. Um, maybe this is some, you know, uh, maybe they have a high total immunoglobulin G. Um, if you see that every, um, you know, uh, IgA specific IgA is elevated. Oh, you can suspect maybe there's interference. If we go back to that little slide that had the four, um, uh, this little quadrants here, you can use this in the same way. Um, so even though you don't have the total immunoglobulin panel, you really wanna look for those variability of results. Um, and if you suspect that there is interference, well, then you know you do what you would do with any other lab when you have um, abnormal results that may require further workup. You say, you know what? I think we should get a total immunoglobulin panel done just to make sure you know this isn't test interference. Um, so yeah, I think you can. You know, um, the the advantage of dry blood spot testing is just so wonderful. Obviously, for you know virtual practices, remote practices, and you know remote and rural locations. Um, you know, you don't need the total immunoglobulin panel with every zoomer by any um, means. You only, if you see, um, if you're doing zoomers and you see all of the specific IgA coming back low or all of the specific IgG coming back low or all of the results coming back high, then you're going to suspect interference. But really, if you've got some normal results, some moderate results, and some positive results, you're good to go. <laughs> Does that make sense? 